And just to say uh, welcome to James Cass. We're delighted to have you with us today. James is a consultant for the European Space Agency, and he's going to talk to us today uh, on lessons learned in COVID times. And uh, moderating our session will be Anna Turiaga. She's the head of the European School of Administration. And I will give the floor to Anna now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Of course, uh, thank you so much, James, for being with us today. And uh, welcome everybody uh, who is listening um, to another one of our USA online talks. You're wondering why do we do these talks? Uh, where well, we do them to offer top speakers uh, to make us uh, really reflect about the political, economical, or societal issues that are making the headlines today. So we have had almost 150 talks since the start of confinement. We have been very productive. And if you missed some, no worries. You can still see them because all our recordings are available in the USA website. And I really would like to invite you to take a look because I am sure there is something for everyone. So please go and, and have a look about uh, the other sessions because we really had some very interesting ones. Another one of our objectives is to look for speakers that can really make a difference for our daily work so we can do our tasks even better. And uh, what better way to improve than to learn from our mistakes. As you know, it is uh, well known by everyone that those who cannot remember the past will be condemned to repeat it. So it is very important to be humble, to see our mistakes, have the courage to admit them, and the wish to correct them, uh, as this is the beginning, I think, of wisdom and learning. And I also challenge all of you listening, do you tend to listen to those agreeing with you, or do you also have time and space to hear out those who may not have the same opinion? I wonder. Uh, today, uh, as we are navigating a worldwide pandemic, uh, putting in danger millions of lives, being humble in recognizing our mistakes and willing to learn from them has become, I think, a real necessity. And as policymakers, it is very important to see how can we learn from what has not worked well so we can feed that into our policy, our next uh, policy making project, so we can ensure better results. To help us uh, with all these important and interesting uh, thoughts, uh, we have today uh, Dr. James Gass. And uh, James, I would like to say a few words about you before we start, if I may. You are originally from Canada. Uh, you are a physicist, a research scientist in nuclear physics, neurophysiology, and space psychology. You have worked in the area of human space flight for most of uh, your career and served as a professor of applied human sciences. You also set up a lessons learned system, which is of course very interesting for our talk today at the European Space Agency, as well as uh, you have also been giving sessions uh, on this in the commission. You have lived in six countries on three different continents and you're currently living in the Netherlands where you run your consultancy to help organizations to be more resilient and effective. So for us, it's a real pleasure, James, to have you back and I would like to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Anna, for these uh, very kind words. I hope you hear me. And uh, I'm very pleased and honored to uh, be invited to uh, give you this talk. And I'm pleased that Anna remembered me after the uh, five years ago when I did give my uh, lecture and uh, training session at the European Commission, which was indeed a great pleasure. And I had very great and helpful staff there who were very open. And I must say, uh, I have had some very good experiences with the European Commission. Uh, recently, we did a knowledge management study for the Commission, and I was impressed. We went around 12 DGs interviewing people, and I was uh, struck by the openness and uh, self-reflection and openness to candidness from uh, all of those we interviewed. Uh, it was, uh, I, I had been rather uh, wondering how it would be, but it went much better than what I thought. And I was really uh, impressed. It was, it was a good experience getting to know the people and uh, seeing the openness. And this, the very fact that Anna has invited me is a demonstration of this openness, which is really the basis and the pillars and the prerequisite for learning lessons. So let me go and share my screen and start the talk as uh, without losing any more time. And uh, 
So it is, uh, I believe this is the right screen. We will see if it is. And I will. Okay, do you see the presentation? Yes, yes. Okay, wonderful. Lessons learned in COVID times. But there is something there at the bottom called the silver lining. Uh, we, uh, when we, had, we have had this great, you might say despondency, gloom, all this lockdown. We couldn't go to our restaurants. We couldn't enjoy ourselves. And we are all waiting to get vaccinated and get this thing over and gone. And uh, I, my thesis here is let us grasp what we can learn from this. You know, Isaac Newton, during his time of quarantine uh, uh, at, at the time of the terrible plague, which was a few hundred years ago, used the time to uh, discover laws of physics and mathematics and wrote his famous Mathematica. At least a lot, a lot of it was written during his time of quarantine. And uh, maybe let us look and see, not maybe, what is our silver lining to this crisis? And our silver lining is uh, both learning lessons why we failed. We did fail, let's face it. Uh, um, all, when I say we, I'm referring to our Western countries, our Western democracies, which I belong to. Uh, we did fail, but let us see what the underlying systemic existential lessons that we should be learning. Not only that we won't, should not be caught unprepared again when the next, next disaster strikes, whatever the strike is, but in general for our lives, our countries, our future, what we are doing. If we can learn that, then we will have really grasped that uh, silver lining. So highlights. Uh, we think we know what West lessons learned are, but let's look at it. Let's look at it and understand well, what it's about. Although Anna has given such a good introduction, I think I won't have to give such a long one. I'll be able to go through it more quickly. Then the second part, we will maybe look a little bit at the pandemic. I'm not a medical doctor or a pharmaceutical expert, so please don't expect that part from me, but see what lessons we learned that can be carried over to other uh, aspects of our lives as well, and ourselves and our nations, our countries, our governments, our media. And then the third part will be trying to see what is the systemic problem we have. I believe what I see is there is a certain uh, failure to learn. It's nothing new. Throughout the 6,000 years of uh, written history, uh, we have seen a lot of failure to learn, but we have also seen uh, situations where governments and people have learned from experience. And we have done that as well. We have also learned from some experience in some uh, recent situations, but we'll talk about that. And then we'll look into the future and see what the challenges are we are having because they are not simply these viral challenges, and how we can we should be watching out to see what our future generations will be telling about us, whether we have properly learned our lessons and uh, uh, prevented uh, further terrible crises. So, what are lessons learned? Well, as was said, history repeats itself. Why? Because no one was listening the first time. So we often say, oh, if, if, if I had been the ruler or I had been there, I would have done it differently. Yes, in retrospect, after the fact, we can often say that. Uh, uh, we were not properly prepared. Uh, we could have been. Uh, I, I, I know how I would do it. Uh, do we really? Would we have done differently? Or would we have made the same mistakes? As was said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And repeating mistakes is costly. Uh, it's, it's, we, it is, it costs dearly much more than the uh, spending the time learning about not to repeat them. 
but how can we how can we avoid mistakes we have to in order to be avoid them we have to have a certain awareness of the details to where we have to to learn from mistakes and to learn from successes we have to be able to learn the right lesson and this can be a difficult process because sometimes we are learning the wrong lesson and i attended a talk a session recently in the hague it was called future shock a conference uh, future force and one of the problems they underlined was the hybrid warfare we are facing today hybrid warfare meaning not just bombs and cannons and airplanes but the media and the attack we are uh, receiving from uh, propaganda and other false information and one of the uh, 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 talks gave a very good uh, example and he said you know in the old days when the soviet union was performing their propaganda they were doing such an awful job of it we really most of us were not really endangered but nowadays our enemies are doing a much better job they have taken a lot of the lessons we have written in our books and they are feeding back to us far better than we can imagine. And the talk also said, the speaker also said, how do we solve all of this? And one of the important fundamentals he identified was truth. In the end, it's not trying to spread propaganda back. It's not trying to give false information back. And this is what often we are doing, unfortunately. But we are safer if we tell the truth. Uh, Churchill said, the farther back you can look, the farther forward you can are likely to see. We avoid often and we don't pay attention to history. Our history books are usually written by our own historians who try to uh, paint what we did in uh, as wonderful colors as we can. Uh, we had the same problem in the past. Uh, Herodotus liked, in the, uh, the ancient Greek uh, author and speaker, liked to paint the history of Greece in wonderful colors because he was invited to give talks. And uh, he realized if he gave terrible talks, then uh, telling them how bad things were, he wouldn't be invited again. And sometimes he wanted to boast about a war that was carried out. But actually, that war was an illegal, awful war that should never have taken place. So he had to change history a little bit to paint those people, those victims, as terrible enemies so that he could boast about that war. So this is nothing new. We see some of that today. It happened two and a half thousand years ago. And they noticed it. Thucydides, a little bit later, criticized their auditors and said, that's exactly what he's doing. We shouldn't be doing that. We should be trying to find the truth. This is nothing new. I didn't discover it today. This was a few thousand years ago written down. What it means is we have to be demanding the truth, questioning the narrative. And only then can we really maintain those values that we boast of having. So part of this talk and a critical aim of this talk is to underline the critical importance of learning lessons, but from truth, not from falsehood. I mean, it is often said, uh, what you have not experimented and experienced yourself, well, you have not learned. It is also said, ah, it's a lot of effort. If we install a lessons learned system, a similar one that I installed at the European Space Agency, it's a lot of effort and it has little benefit. And I have to admit that system I installed after I left is not being used much. I hate to say it, uh, but this is the truth. Another excuse we find is the times are changing and uh, lessons of the past are no longer relevant today. This is wrong. They are, believe it or not. 
We just have to glean those truths. So let's use this example because we called DOC uh, lessons learned in COVID time. So I think we should talk a little bit about the pandemic and its uh, lessons. Otherwise, uh, Anna might be annoyed at me. So <laughs> uh, it's the pandemic is really a war against an invisible enemy. And uh, we, we see that even the ancients also uh, uh, understood this. And as I've already mentioned, uh, without the truth, we can uh, seldom learn lessons. But if we mask the truth to protect our reputation or our illicit actions, then the truth is lost and we can trust the lost and we can seldom recover from that. And moreover, if we have these half truths or uh, false falsifications and apologetics, we certainly will not be able to learn the right lessons for the future. So this is part of what we are trying to, uh, uh, the challenge we are facing, is to build this shield of truth that will protect us in winning any war. And the question is here, what happened? Did we listen to warnings to be prepared? There were warnings, but we didn't listen. I'll talk about that. Were we too proud to learn lessons from other nations' crises? You see, uh, pandemics did occur, and epidemics did occur in various countries in Africa and in the Far East. And those countries did learn something. And actually, uh, many of them who did learn fared much better. And we did have warnings about a potential coronavirus that could attack us, and we didn't listen. When supplies were insufficient, what happened? I know here in the Netherlands, it was said, well, masks are not very important. It's really important for the, for the hospital workers, but in general, it's not so important. The main thing is to wash your hands. And once the masks were available, then it began to be very important. Uh, partly because um, it was embarrassing that our advanced uh, nations could not produce something simple like masks. Very strange. Months went on end and we couldn't buy any. Uh, this crisis, unfortunately, has unleashed some political unpleasantness. We have sometimes engaged in politically attacking others, whether it be uh, out of uh, jealousy, when our uh, uh, enemy uh, declares that they have been the first to create a vaccine, then we are all very annoyed about it. That was far too early and it shouldn't have been declared, et cetera, et cetera. And we are fully attacking. Yes, yes, it could have been too early, declared too early for political reasons. Of course, of course, there is much uh, criticism that we can levy against these others. But uh, should we maybe have tried to take the opportunity of this shared crisis to bring us together with our supposed enemies and cooperate rather than fling insults at each other? Uh, were there costs of COVID casualties by maybe some unnecessary delays? I'm not sure. There are many questions asked on this and many accusations made. I don't know what the truth is, but we should really look at ourselves and candidly try to understand. And if we do, this is the beginning of our wisdom. Uh, let us look uh, briefly. I think many of you already know this, so I won't go into very great detail, but just for completeness, maybe I should, uh, uh, it, it belongs in this part of the talk. Uh, we have seen a number of countries in the Far East who have suffered uh, very few deaths. Uh, when I say deaths, deaths per million. I'm not sure that I believe all those figures because statistics can lie. Uh, it depends how you count them, uh, how you uh, declare a death to be from COVID or from something else. So we have to be careful. Uh, maybe we have been more honest in our countries and in the West and they have not been as honest. I don't know. But this difference is very great. 
And such a difference, maybe it's exaggerated, cannot be totally denied. There was something that maybe they were doing a little bit more right than we were doing. And what lessons can we uh, learn from this? They learned lessons from their past epidemics, as I mentioned. Some of the lessons, I tried to look at it and try to uh, see what were some of the key things that maybe we could learn from. They set up a clearly defined tiered command structure, which was ready to respond for such outbreaks. We didn't have it. We were quickly trying to set all this up. And this was ad hoc. Each country tried to do it. The commission tried to do it. We all were trying. America was trying to be done. And it was, to a great extent, hap haphazard uh, and not very well, because it was not. These things have to be prepared in advance. I have worked in the domain of human spaceflight, and I can assure you, all we had to spend hours debating what contingencies could happen and how we could prepare ourselves for them. We spent days defining all possible errors and then going through simulations to try to learn how to handle them. And of course, things happen where we were not prepared. That always does happen. But we certainly put a lot of effort into it. Uh, we certainly did not put a lot of effort into preparing ourselves for such crises. Uh, these countries invested in research preparedness. In other words, they researched how to be prepared and they set up prepared dialogue between the scientific community and the policy making. What has been often accused is that the two are not quite coordinated. Some scientists have been saying some things and policymakers have been saying a different thing. And it could be because there were certain things not prepared. If there aren't enough masks, then you say that masks are not, not important. Um, the countries also introduced early and stringent border restrictions. Now we do have a challenge with the European Union. We have open borders. But if we look at some of the countries like China, I hate to bring that as an example because uh, China is not the, uh, is such an authoritarian, not very nice country to see as a good example, but there are some times that we can learn things and we, we should try to learn even from those we don't approve of. They even had border restrictions set up between their different provinces. And what I heard recently, I communicated with some Chinese friends to find out how it was going. And they said, you know, it's not simply a, a flight from New Delhi to Beijing, where the people have to be quarantined. But if you are flying from Beijing to Shanghai, you have to be quarantined for a couple of weeks and properly quarantined. I was surprised. I mean, within? He said, yes. So if you have, if you change flights, you end up having two quarantines. I couldn't believe it. I don't know whether this is still being carried out, but at least some people I know have to suffer through two quarantines because they have to change, they change flights. Uh, amazing, but they did do that. These were very stringent, but I believe that helped to control the spread. Uh, now, another habit that people have in the East, and this is not new, and it, this is not since simply these last pandemics of a few, or epidemics, sorry, a few years ago in the Far East. This has been long uh, habit. When I visited the Far East in the early 80s, I noticed people were wearing face masks, many. And I asked them why. They said either they felt that they may be sick, so they wore it so as not to spread it, or they felt that their immune systems were low and they were susceptible, so they wore masks in crowded places to keep themselves from catching anything from others. And this they were doing. 30 years ago when I was there and probably long before. Uh, here in the West, it has been a big problem uh, getting people to wear their masks properly. I'll go into that a bit later. They also introduced electronic and mandatory track and trace, not in all the countries and not as efficiently uh, in, in all equally efficient in each country, but 
they introduced it in a way that would be very difficult, I believe, for us to introduce. We have a lot of concern of data privacy. And if you try to uh, uh, do your track and trace properly, uh, people will protest that they are being followed and spied upon, and that such measures, once introduced, will not be lifted. And this is part of the problem of introducing an effective track and trace method. But you cannot introduce it just as a as a as a as a, uh, a, a pandemic uh, breaks out. This has to be practiced in advance. The laws have to be looked into. The software has to be. It has to be simulated properly. This is not something that can be done at the last minute. It has been tried and it has also uh, failed. But there are ways of having effective track and trace and still protecting data privacy. And I talked to some companies because I had some very good ideas. And some of my team members actually uh, uh, developed uh, methods uh, uh, for, for this purpose. And we tried to get investors. And you know what the investors told, told us? They said, this is not a requirement of our national or European laws. They have not defined uh, such potential track and trace methods that will still protect privacy. And unless we have such demands, we won't make such applications that cost too much and we won't have customers for them because people won't, will still be afraid of using them. So there is a problem here. There are solutions. It has to look in, be looked into. It is not an easy uh, uh, challenge to, to uh, overcome. Timely and vigorous response avoided, avoided lengthy national lockdowns. They did have lockdowns, but they were introduced early and introduced effectively. And this helped them with their success. These are some of what I gleaned that I saw in some of the countries in the Far East and maybe some of the European countries also, uh, but which were mainly uh, missing that I think we could be looking at. Uh, but what I also noticed was a great amount of misunderstanding and ignorance from the general public. There was a certain lack of understanding what this crisis is all about and what common sense precautions are. Uh, there were problems understanding uh, uh, at the beginning, we dependent on the WHO. What did they tell us? They told us it was mainly respiratory droplets. Well, uh, th th you don't really need masks to stop those. Uh, but uh, it turned out to be uh, uh, any form of aerosols also. But did we need the WHO to tell us such things? 30 years ago, people were wearing masks when they had a cold. So there's nothing new. We don't really have to depend upon Big Brother uh, uh, guiding us on every step. We have to use our own common sense. We issued blanket rules, one and a half meters. I see it in the shopping malls in the Netherlands. Keep one and a half meters uh, apart in the shops. So you have a small shop and you're trying to keep your one and a half meters apart. And then I see the same sign in the dunes where it's totally empty, even on the entry to the beaches where it's totally empty saying, keep one and a half meters. Well. Do you really need your, the same rule outside in nature with the wind and fresh air blowing as you need inside a shop? Does, is it not common sense to understand that the stale air in a closed uh, place, even if it has some air conditioning, we breathe the same air that other people are breathing? Uh, it has been measured that uh, these viral molecules can float around three or four hours in a closed uh, uh, room with a low ceiling and with poor ventilation. In other words, your one and a half meters is not going to protect you at all. Even three meters is not going to protect you. But this does not, does this require a great PhDs to do this research or is it not common sense? But still we got the same rules and people were trying to observe and follow the same rules, whether they were out in the blowing wind or indoors. I noticed some people wearing a mask, walking in the dunes in the Netherlands, 
uh, where hardly a soul or on the empty beaches in winter uh, wearing masks. I don't know what those masks are supposed to protect them from. They should be trying to breathe fresh air. And then I noticed in shops, people wearing a mask over their mouths to keep their noses free to be able to breathe and breathe in whatever microbes and uh, molecules are available. And then when they talked, they lowered their mask to give, make their mouths free. And then they covered their mouths when their mouths were closed again. Well, I mean, uh, if this is the type of common sense we see amongst our populations, something is wrong. If you tried to do this in the Far East, another person would start scolding you. That's what I was told by some of the people. They don't need the police everywhere. People are their own policemen. And if somebody behaves in such a stupid manner, he would be scolded by the fellow person walking next to him. I tried to scold some fellow uh, people here in the Netherlands who were not observing the right precautions. And they told me, oh, you're taking things too seriously, forget it. And I was laughed away. If you want to not, if you want to keep your one and a half meters on a footpath, you have to jump into the ditch or on the grass because the uh, young people walking through, they will keep to the center and you'll have to brush past them as close as a few centimeters in order to be able to walk. Uh, it's not taken that seriously. Sometimes when I see the behavior of some of the people, I hear, I begin to think they don't, there is no COVID crisis at all. So these are the kind of things, as soon as I notice when the restrictions were lifted, not from the newscast, simply in nature, when we went for a walk or a bicycle ride, suddenly nature became empty and the footpaths were empty because people were rushing to the shops and to the restaurants because they could st finally start enjoying themselves. From one day to the next, does it suddenly become safer? because the government has declared that certain restrictions are lifted. This shows how seriously and uh, irresponsibly we, we in the West, many of our freedom loving people have taken this crisis. To a great extent, we are to blame. Uh, sometimes we see, unfortunately, that countries with a democratic deficit tend to handle the pandemic better. This is very unfortunate. Uh, but we see rules as a loss of freedom. It invades our democracy instead of uh, understanding that we have to fulfill obligations to society. Uh, and in many ways, I think even when I look go to the school curricula nowadays, they're teaching even youngsters in uh, junior school about their rights and freedoms instead of teaching about responsibility and responsibilities and obligations. Maybe we are doing something slightly wrong in how we are bringing up the next generation. It's not simply a matter of the right laws and the right committees. It's much more than that that is missing in our society. Uh, when ancient Egypt went through this uh, crisis uh, of uh, seven, they, 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 before they had the seven years of drought, they have seven years of plenty. And what did they do? According to the Bible, they were warned about it, but we don't really know what happened. Uh, during their years of plenty, they stored the extra grain that they could use during the year of uh, uh, low grain and drought. Uh, in 2015, there was a TED talk, the next outbreak, we're not ready. And this warned about the spread of a potential coronavirus. I was amazed when I heard that talk. I heard it only recently, but it happened five years, five or six years ago. And it said, we are not equipping ourselves and we should. We should learn lessons from history. That's what that talk talks about. And uh, uh, Bill Gates, who gave the talk, I'm not a fan of all of these that he's done, but I do uh, uh, understand in this case, he was right. Uh, we need to do more simulations, germ games, instead of all those war games. Yes, 
That's what we learned in space flight, that we have to play those games of errors and mistakes and simulate, simulate all the contingencies in order to understand how to handle them and be prepared. Uh, we still make mistakes. We are not doing that here. How about our young people? Most of the talks I, I listened to on television was on how terrible it was for young people not to be able to uh, study together in their classrooms, go to the bar together, go to their discos. They were not able to enjoy their lives. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Uh, 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 I, I can't, it has been a long time since any of us have suffered the real wars and real situations of uh, restrictions. But maybe we should, and this is a suggestion, maybe we should try to recruit and prepare our young people in the form of preparedness for uh, preparedness for a community, uh, military community disaster, not simply to fight wars, but also to take constructive action when there is a crisis. This is what I see as being missing. In the old days, we had much more in the form of Boy Scouts or Girl Guides or whatever. Uh, there still is that, but it's only a few take part. But maybe all, without exception, young people should be recruited for such purposes to fulfill their duties in society. It's not simply a matter of getting something for nothing. We get our education for nothing in, the, in Europe and many universities. That's great, that's wonderful. But maybe we have a duty that we have to teach our young that they own and not simply the rights to uh, receive. So the next part, the general problem of lessons learned. And this is maybe what uh, uh, we are, uh, uh, I talked earlier to Anna, I said, well, there are some parts of the talk which may be somewhat politically incorrect, but uh, it doesn't matter how it's given free license. Uh, mainstream media, okay, I don't think we have to take that as a, as a critique uh, in, uh, in, in, in the, uh, uh, our governments. It is the mainstream media we're talking about in the first instance. But has it become a propaganda tool? Is the news you see being biased, skewed headlines, deafening silence? There is a lot of sinking trust. Uh, these are five themes that I'm going to uh, analyze now if I have time. We are losing investigative in independent journalism. We are seeing a slow death. And I've heard there may be a talk in the near future on this subject, and I'm uh, very pleased about it because I cannot handle it in just two slides here properly. Uh, but we are seeing armchair instead of on site uh, reporting, collusion with paymasters. We have seen the uh, 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 mainstream media uh, being collated and joining together and being controlled by just fewer and fewer and bigger organizations. And these are the ones who are sometimes dictating what appears or what doesn't appear. The paymasters are unfortunately becoming more and more politically uh, influenced and ideological. Uh, is there too much of a revolving door between our media, our governments, and our arms industries? or our pharmaceutical industries or whatever. What, are we seeing uh, too much collusion? Uh, how about investigation? Are we losing the independence? Are they becoming politically influenced? Can we trust them anymore? Our social media, uh, the owners of our privacy are becoming our judges and censors. Our public institutions, have is trust flagging. Let's handle these. And we've seen that our democratic society really is supported by a few critical pillars. Representation, yes. Knowledge, yes, and justice. 
However, all of these are dependent on having truth. If we don't have truth, we can't really know who we are voting for and what we are voting for. If we don't have truth, we cannot have true justice. So the truth and the knowledge is going to be very, is very important. Uh, mainstream media is becoming less trusted than ever. We see that uh, only 19% of European respondents had a high trust in the media. And that was back in 2015. That's gotten even worse. Uh, okay, moderate trust uh, approached something like 45% or so. Uh, we see that 56% of Americans, I'm just showing you some of these figures because I was uh, myself surprised at them. I didn't realize that our readers were so alert. I thought most of us were not. They agree with the following statements. Journalists and reporters are purposely trying to mislead people by saying things they know are false or gross exaggeration. Amazing. But no, when I read the mainstream media, I see that it's true. I'm just amazed that so many other people have seen that as well. Uh, we see a large number who uh, don't have trust. We see the social media has little trust. We see that new uh, uh, a majority of news organizations are becoming more ideological uh, or political rather than informing and investigative. Uh, most countries have said their trust in media is low. In journalism we trust, no longer. Nelson Mandela, one of my uh, heroes in a way, uh, for many uh, things he did, not all the things he did in all of, all of his life, but he learned, he learned. He used to uh, uh, support much more violence in his early days, but later on he began to, uh, he learned a lot. And he, when he became president, did a lot of wise things, such as setting up the truth and reconciliation. But he said, a critical, independent, and investigative press is the lifeblood of democracy, and that was pointed out, and that is true, and that is true, has always been true, is true today, and will continue to be true. So is journalism fulfilling? Is it seeking the truth? Is it investigating instead of opinionating? Uh, I won't go through all of this, but we are beginning to see a loss of it uh, in what we are doing. Uh, we are seeing uh, a lot of uh, 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 persuasion and, you might say, silence or skewed reporting. There are many, uh, I tried to look up and I, I was hit over the last five or six years uh, about what I saw were hidden stories that were not being reported. And I thought I would just mention a few as examples. Uh, we see, for example, our hero, Alexei Navalny, uh, who uh, uh, is investigating, supposedly investigating corruption in Russia. Uh, and I believe he probably is. Uh, but he also has his other side. He has joined white supremacist nationalists. They advocate extermination of Muslim extremists, expulsion of non-ethnic non, uh, Russians from Russia. Uh, a lot of horrible sides, but this is not uh, shown because if he is going to be our hero, even, even Amnesty International at one point removed his status as a protester uh, 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 and uh, as a person who is persecuted. Well, they finally were uh, persuaded to restore his status. Uh, the white helmets who are supposed to be our heroes, who are doing wonderful jobs of rescuing poor people who have been uh, killed or injured in this horrible civil war. Uh, but it has been reported, and I have reasons to believe it, that a lot of their rescue work was of one side, the rebels and those also belonging to some terrorist groups are those who are mainly being rescued. Also that they have been supported by some hundred million dollars for making wonderful films. Well, if they don't uh, give the right information to their paymasters, then they won't get their money, obviously. 
I'm not saying that we paid them to save lives, no, but there is a temptation to do so because they, you have to earn your money. This is the problem of a lot of such squealers. I myself did study some of the films and I saw how there were retakes of victims being rescued, how the victim gets up and has a drink and uh, shouts Allah Akbar and then lies down again and is once again rescued so to, to do it properly. I've seen that. It's not simply um, uh, something which uh, social media has told us. I have seen the ISIS flags uh, being waved by a supposed dying uh, uh, victim who afterwards jumps up and waves his Kalashnikov. Um, doesn't, this doesn't mean that it's always happening. And I'm not saying that they are not doing some good. I'm just saying that only one side is being presented. Uh, I watched the horrible films of the, build, of the burning building in Odessa. Rebels had taken over the building from the, uh, one of the big buildings and uh, protesting the Kiev government. As in those days, lots of protests going on everywhere. But there were some uh, far right extremists who had come because there was a football game. And I saw in the films how they threw Molotov cocktails into the building from the outside through the windows to start the fire. And then how barricades were placed on the ed exit doors so that the poor people inside could not escape. And what did the Western media talk about it? They said a fire broke out and the rebels inside had uh, blockaded themselves inside the building. Yes, a fire did break out and they were blockaded, but the headlines and the article gave the impression that the fire was started inside the building and the blockade was only from the inside. But when they cleared the doors on the inside, they couldn't get out because it was blockaded from the outside as well. I even saw how some of the uh, people outside who were wearing some horrible looking uniforms which one would identify as neo-Nazi, shooting those who jumped down, jumped out of the windows to escape the fire and shooting them on the way down. And some of them were killed and some of them who arrived on the ground were then beaten up if they were not enough injured uh, by jumping down. I saw that. Did the mainstream media talk about that? No. Why was it not covered? Because the uh, government that was supported by some of these extremists was now pro-Western. Maybe. I don't know. But this is very disturbing when you see such things. I heard a conversation between two leaders in Europe talking about the Maidan shooting. You know, as soon as Yanukovych was uh, uh, finally agreed on the demands of the demonstrators to uh, negotiate with the European Union and to uh, hold a new election, the day afterwards, there was this great shooting where both police and demonstrators were killed. And this conversation that was recorded, and it was not denied the truth of it, the observers were saying that the bullets were this one and the same shooting both the demonstrators and the police. And they all came from one direction and the building that was from that direction happened to be occupied by certain extreme groups. This did not appear in the mainstream media or not much, or at least I didn't find it, maybe it did. Uh, there was no investigation afterwards. And there was no demand for it. There were no sanctions against uh, the Kiev government uh, because they did not investigate. There are many other such examples happening, which I'm sure your next speaker will hopefully bring up and hope. But uh, if I would properly talk about it, my time is soon running out, so I better uh, uh, and not talk too much. And now it's 44 minutes, I believe. Uh, we really. Uh, see a certain uh, number of unacceptable stories are missing or skewed in order to fit our Western narrative or the narrative by some governments in the West, I should say. Uh, 
how can we hold to account those in power when we ourselves are ignorant of facts? I won't go into detail on this, but this shows uh, 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 the headlines in a Ukrainian uh, website and newspaper uh, showing pro-Russian militants pick up debris at the jet crash site. It was part of a video which I found, which showed the same person holding up this doll, not as a trophy as was came out as the comments on this article, but in reverence, paying this, making the sign of the cross and bowing his head in reverence and prayer. The same video clip presented in totally different ways. Uh, this is a problem if we're living. Uh, uh, should I end soon, Anna, or do I have a few more minutes? Well, we have a few more minutes before we can go to the questions. Okay, I'll try to uh, 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 try to wrap it up. We see also, and I'll best just be very fairly quick here. Our public institutions trust is also at a historic low. Not only our mainstream media, but our public institutions. So the mainstream media that is supposed to be guarding us and calling to question and guarding the gates and watching our public institutions. They cannot be trusted. Our public institutions are now uh, less and less trusted. We see both in America and in Europe these figures, which you will read in my power in my presentation later on, uh, demonstrate that you may already know it. But the least uh, 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 respected professionals are those in America are those members of Congress, and in Europe are those uh, political parties. So we really are doing badly. We are not doing very well. Our investigations are also not going very well. We have fake analyses. We uh, 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 independent investigations tend to be very uh, less than independent. We uh, they depend the political appo appointees at many of the organizations are duty bound to uh, uh, please their paymasters and suppressing inconvenient uh, truth. Uh, we already know, and I believe the next slide will uh, talk about it. Uh, we see that the Duma chemical attack, which the horrible Syrian government, well, I don't say they're not horrible, but uh, supposedly took place. They were, the bombing took place four days after this supposed chemical attack. Is that enough time for an investigation? When it was, we were told afterwards, it will take weeks, if not months to investigate. Well, then how can one come to a conclusion so quickly? Uh, are we, did we see the Alice in Wonderland uh, syndrome of the verdict being uh, um, declared uh, before the trial? Uh, when recently in parliament, uh, an embarrassing question would be, was asked by one parliamentarian to the director of OPCW. He was told that he should be more polite when uh, talking to such an important person as a director. Uh, and his microphone was even muted when he refused to be polite. Uh, the director did not answer any of his questions. Why are we afraid of that? when a previous director of the OPCW and other experts who were on the ground in Syria, their opinions were suppressed. Even one of them was not, a, not given a visa to go to uh, New York uh, to enter the, uh, uh, the United Nations and make his presentation. Uh, to such an extent was the suppression uh, carried out. Uh, a peer-reviewed scientific paper was withdrawn. When this is going to be happening, what can we expect when even scientific papers, we are afraid of their being published? And this is not the first time that a scientific paper has been withdrawn. There was another scientific paper on climate change that was withdrawn because it did not fit with the narrative. This is a terrible time we are getting into when we are uh, suppressing these things. Uh, I won't go into all of this. Uh, there are other matters that have been suppressed, whether it's Stefan Bandera, who is honored. That's a monument to this Nazi who was uh, rounding up Jews and uh, giving them to the Germans during the Second World War. And he is honored. Uh, you can see the condition of this wonderful monument in, uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, 
some way, somehow, I don't see much about this monument in Western uh, media. Uh, social media, we have the problems there. They are the ones who decide what is right and wrong and who will be banned. What priorities, when you make a Google search, why don't you find what you're looking for? If they don't like that kind of thing, they may not be, uh, they mean, they, we don't know how their algorithms work and they won't even tell us. Uh, they spy on our every move, but we uh, don't know exactly what they're doing with that information. And then our governments are telling the social media and the platforms that they should filter what is fake or true? What is hate or non-hate? Uh, are they going to be the judges of what we have thought to say and think what we please? And now, even in social media, we may not be allowed to do this. We are seeing the banning of people, whether we like it or not. These are, this is what is happening. How can we learn lessons if we are going to become, we are even going to have censorship eventually of things that are unacceptable. Uh, if this is happening and we cannot understand the truth, what is truth and fake, and we are only looking at misleading headlines, uh, how are we able to learn useful lessons from experience? And how are we able to start uh, uh, differentiating truth and falsehood. Perhaps we need a good dose of more critical thinking. We have to start thinking of ourselves. We start, and this actually could take almost a lecture in itself, but just in one slide, there is a possibility when you see a narrative to analyze it and see whether it makes sense. Just ask certain questions. Does the accuser benefit from the accusation? Who is benefit? Who is being hurt? Does the scenario make sense at all for the goal that is supposedly trying to be reached? Is it logical? Uh, there are many such questions and one could give a whole lecture on this and giving examples on it, but we really have almost lost that ability of critical thinking, because that is what we are dependent on. We can't depend on our government, we can't depend on the mainstream media, we can't depend on social media, we have to depend to a great extent on ourselves. And uh, this is also what is missing. And we don't need a PhD, even a child, as we can see in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, can see sometimes the nonsense of what is perpetrated. Uh, Ask the right question, demand the right answers. This is the beginning of wisdom. You can tell whether a man is clever by his answers, but whether a man is wise by his question. Uh, I just uh, tell you here how you can look uh, an example and maybe I should close. Uh, am I running? I think I have to run out of, I'm running out of time soon. Sorry? You can continue at your ease, no problem with the time. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just give you this as an example of critical thinking, not critical race thinking, no, critical thinking. And um, let us look at statistics and see how we can come up with two totally opposing conclusions. And this is a very short lesson in three minutes, which we should really to be given in an hour, but maybe another time. The BBC um, uh, recently printed an article, but they're not the only one, many other mainstream media did the same thing, showing that although African-Americans are 14% of the population, they accounted for 24% of fatal shootings by police. This showed statistically, significantly, an anti-Black bias of 70%. Yeah, because 24 and 14, that's about 70% more, right? Wrong. If you ask the same question about male and female shooting, you see that very few females have been shot. So you will have an anti-male bias of 2000% by the same logic. Yeah, 
The simple thing is fewer females are committing such violent crimes and resisting arrest in the same way, and therefore fewer are being shot and killed. And similarly, with the difference of, I dare uh, say, it, with, between African Americans and the rest of the population. Now, let us look at the actual figures. And this is the same statistics that these, the first conclusion is based on. If one asks the question differently, how do you compare crime or violent crime or homicide offenders? That is a, that is a number that you cannot uh, 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 play around with, with in the two populations. You see that white and black homicide offenders are roughly the same. You have roughly 3,200 and some odd uh, uh, homicide offenses committed by the white and black communities. Police killings of white and black, you see white 457 in 2017 and 223 black. In other words, for roughly the same number of homicides committed by each community, you have half as many killed who are black than white. The same statistics. Now, if therefore, one compared homicide offenses with police shootings, you see an anti-white bias of 100%. Now, I don't want to get into this black-white debate. I'm just looking here at statistics and showing and demonstrating how we have to think critically and ask the right questions when we try to come to conclusions. Because looking at it this way, it looks like all of these headlines about bias and anti-black bias are actually false. I don't want to argue the point, it's up to you to look at these figures and come to your own conclusion. But depending on the framing of the question, you see a bias either against blacks or against whites. The same numbers. So it is very important how we ask the right questions and asking the right questions of the right people. In the Challenger accident, uh, the aftermath of it, that was in 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger uh, had a terrible accident and blew up shortly after launch. And this affected me because I was doing my research and we were planning our next mission and we couldn't plan it. So uh, Professor Feynman, one of the most renowned uh, physicists in the world, uh, did some analysis. And he went down to the various NASA institutions and asked questions. But he was very careful. He came a couple of days earlier than he was supposed to come to these institutions. And instead of meeting the directors, he met with a lot of the lower level engineers who are doing the real work and know what is going on. And he asked them, what would be the statistic of a space shuttle accident? And he did his survey and he found there was something like 100, one in 100, one in 200, one in 300. That was roughly the figure he got. In other words, one in 100 launches, one to one in 300 launches, roughly speaking. Then he started his official meetings at the different sites. And strangely, he got an identical answer from all the directors and all the important people. They said, one in 100,000. It was the same answer given by all of them. And this was the problem, asking questions of a political appointee and a director who has agreed on what is the correct answer to give and asking the question of the real person doing the work. And this is the same thing that we have seen with the OPCW, asking questions of the director rather than of the experts and dissenters. I have been to the OPCW and I've met many of the people there and they do excellent work. They are wonderful, great scientists and engineers. I have high respect for them. I know some of them personally. However, are we losing our trust in such an expert organization because of this, of what has happened and this uh, suppression of uh, truth? Unfortunately, yes. And even when the, when the, uh, 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 our horrible Russians brought in a number of uh, Syrians to testify at the OPCW. Uh, 
the British and American delegations were withdrawn and didn't. They were forbidden from attending that presentation. And many of the workers, they told me them myself that they were told that their professions would be at stake if they dared go to that hearing. So this is what is happening, unfortunately, today. So what are the future? We, I don't think I'll have much time to go into it, but we are facing challenges. The cancel culture versus truth. Uh, this is happening today. Uh, I think I have to end it soon. So I think this will be a lecture in itself. Uh, we are having banned books, silenced academics. We see that professors are being fired for what they are saying. They are books long, excellent books, even like Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, who exposes slavery and racism. His books are being banned. He was the one who exposed King Leopold of Belgium for his atrocities in the Belgian Congo. And his books are being banned nowadays. What is going on in the name of diversity, equity, and inclusion? We're seeing all kinds of horrible things uh, happening uh, because of various types of theories that are being uh, promulgated. Uh, is this maybe a new face of fascism that we are experiencing? Uh, I believe we could be calling it that. So I, go, I went through rather too quickly on a number of slides, each one which could have given a lecture, but maybe we just uh, summarize everything and we see that uh, in maybe just these few bullets, truth, is fundamental to learning, seeking the truth, seek the truth, you will find it. But analyze critically to discern truth from falsehood. Ask the right question, demand the right answer. Don't repeat your mistakes. Learning from experience is the beginning of wisdom. And remember, if you point a finger at someone else, three fingers are pointing back at you. So if your moral perch is too high, you have a longer way to fall. So learn to see yourself also as others see you and learn to see others as they see themselves. I think at this point, I better uh, close, otherwise I've talked too much. So I will uh, stop and maybe uh, be open to some questions, which I hope I'm able to answer. Thank you so much, James. Indeed, I think you have given us a lot of food for thought. Um, and uh, you have shared some questions from colleagues, so I'm gonna go straight to them. Uh, so what, more than a question, this is a comment that somebody's saying the first element to learn a lesson is to recognize that we have been wrong. Uh, and that seems to be quite hard. Can you comment a little bit on that? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, that was one of, one of my sl many slides that I removed because I had too many. But uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, being able to recognize we are wrong is the key to beginning to think openly. And this is one of the key mistakes we make, and we, whether we are in companies or organizations, we often, uh, maybe our bosses don't want to be recognized that they are wrong, but we often uh, are wrong ourselves. Uh, I remember uh, telling everybody that uh, Karl Marx was a terrible person. He had written all those terrible things, all those lies. And then I read his first book through and through from cover to cover recently. I was very impressed. I didn't agree with his suggestion for the future, how to solve the problems, but his observations were facts. And I had to say, I was wrong. And that is one example. Yes, it's difficult. And I was very humbled because I was taking, even at the time when the United States invaded Iraq, I said, oh, they're doing the right thing. This is the right thing against this horrible person creating weapons of mass destruction. And I remember some of my friends saying, you are wrong. And I said, no, I'm right. And they said, you are wrong. This, is, this has nothing to do with such weapons of mass destruction. And now I realize that I was wrong. How often are we wrong? And can we admit it? Yes, I have learned a lot recently and I have to admit to my great embarrassment and shame that it took me too many decades to learn about our mistakes and what I was believing in. Yes, that is one of the biggest challenges to humbly accept we are wrong, yes. And to apologize for it 
And this has happened also in many countries, whether it be the genocide that happened in Turkey, where the government still doesn't want to admit uh, wrongdoing. It remains a festering wound that will not heal because those killed, it is still not even admitted that there were any mistakes made. I better stop there because I could talk too long on that. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm smiling at your reference to Marx because somebody was saying in another talk the other day that uh, Karl Marx had the right uh, questions, but the wrong answers. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> it was very interesting how he said that. Uh, then uh, actually it, it was uh, also quite striking when you were talking about um, about the responsibility. And I would like you to speak a little bit about the, res the, the, the personal responsibility we all have to really seek for the truth, you know, and to and, and to go for, you know, and not to just receive uh, uh, wisdom from wherever it comes from the media or from our uh, institutions there, uh, because uh, I have just an example here with Brexit. Uh, there was, it was quite, but obvious uh, that, and it was recognized by, by the pro-Brexit uh, camp that they had uh, gross exaggerated some figures about how much money was spent, you know, in, in Europe could be spent for the NHS, you know, and uh, and it was it was openly uh, admitted, uh, but then in, in the elections coming afterwards, so there was no, no punishment for something that has been recognized by, by themselves. So how, how do you, you know, can you can you say something about this, this personal responsibility for seeking the truth? Yes, this is this is a, a problem, and I remember talking to some uh, learned uh, friends and neighbors who said, "Well, they get their information from the main, from the headlines, and uh, what is told to them. They, they can't, don't really have time." And I said, "You know, when we see that our governments are behaving in an uh, irresponsible manner, but we don't inform ourselves and we don't take any responsibility, and and." actually inform ourselves before even we vote for anything, then we are also to blame. We cannot blame it on others. We have to take the responsibility ourselves for these mistakes. And until we begin to recognize that, that we shouldn't always push the blame upstairs, but take a more active role in accepting that we have to be responsible and inform ourselves rather than simply believing such uh, statistics and skewed information that is uh, fed to us by the various parties, yes. But how do you explain that, that we tend to not punish uh, when we have been proven? You know, this is, this is an old trick. Uh, look, at look at what has happened. This is an old trick. Many governments uh, and many organizations and many politicians have succeeded in doing it consciously knowing even mainstream media, they will spread a wrong headline, a false one, and later on in a corner of the paper, issue a retraction. And they know in advance that having issued that retraction, they are more or less safe, but they have achieved their goal of spreading the wrong information. And they can get away with it. And unfortunately, unless somebody takes them to court, then they aren't being held responsible. And they know it in advance that they will probably will not be held responsible be, uh, uh, for what they have done. Uh, it's, it's very unfortunate, whether it's the mainstream media or our politicians. I have no solution to that, other than we should start uh, taking more responsibility ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, what is stopping us? How to stop it? How, what is stopping us from doing that? Oh, most people get their news just before the football game or before the uh, film in the evening. If the film starts at 8.15, it means they have 15 minutes of headlines and that's about it. And most people uh, who watch, read their newspapers, which is the second most area where people get their news, television is the first, uh, newspapers is the second, they read only the headlines. And these headlines are created to give a certain uh, ideological uh, um, impression, and therefore they succeed. Uh, because we don't bother reading the article underneath, which uh, often will include a fair amount of truth, but it is not uh, um, provided in that headline. The headline gives a wrong impression, and it's done on purpose. And if we don't bother reading the article underneath, then we are not informed, and most people can't be bothered. It's more entertaining to look at the crimi on television than to start looking at the details of a critical article. 
And as you pointed out in your, in your talk, I think education of the small children is absolutely essential to, to change this. Uh, and so what is the role of education? Yes, this is, this is one of the big problems. How much in the old days we read books, we actually read things. Nowadays, if you ask about Jane Austen, people only know about the film. They don't know about the book. And unfortunately, the, the books, many books are usually very good. And there is a reason why literature was taught in schools so that one could read the details. And now we have shortcuts. We can go to Hollywood and they will tell us. Uh, few people have read any of the classics. They have only watched them on television. And it's usually a mixture of uh, nonsense and entertainment. And the filmmakers either haven't understood the stories and they're totally missing it uh, 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 and, and depicting a character that is totally opposite with a totally wrong message. And we just believe it and we think that is what it is. Our education system is going down, down the drain. We're spending time educating our young people as to their freedoms and uh, third bathrooms and whatever else. But instead of uh, 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 teach, you know, uh, this is this is one of the problems we have. The critical race theory in America that is coming out and is becoming very popular says we should lower the level of mathematics in the schools to fit all the disadvantaged so that they will all get good grades. There is nothing, no greater lie and nonsense than that. I myself participated in teaching in Detroit schools, which were uh, relegated as the worst 10% in the district. In other words, these were pupils who could not spell their own names, let alone three letter words, words like Y-O-U, you, they would spell it you, Y-U-O, yeah? And we decided to cross racial and financial barriers by teaching mathematics. And I was amazed at how far we got. We were teaching eight to 10 year olds what I did not learn for, uh, at a, as a 16 or 17 year old at school. And this was with the worst black schools in this, mainly black, black schools in the district. The pupils were extremely intelligent if taught properly. And a few of us were PhDs in physics and mathematics or PhD students and professors participated in this project. And just one hour a day, uh, four days a week, we had our full energy for that one hour. And the wonderful teachers who were totally inept uh, collaborated with us and welcomed us with open arms. Uh, they couldn't do the job, but we did. And the results we got were not amazing. They were super amazing. So we don't need to lower any levels. We have to uh, increase our quality of teaching. And look at Finland and Europe. They are a good lesson that we could learn about good teaching. And they don't pay their teachers so much more than uh, we do, but it is a respected profession. So there is a way of achieving and we are failing. Yes, both in schools and universities, we are not teaching people to think critically. Very powerful words. And um, then I'm going to another question here. What happened with the handling of the H1N1 virus that we could have learned from for handling the COVID pandemic? So could we have uh, learned from previous pandemics? Don't you think that maybe we missed something at that moment? I'm yes. talking about the masks, for example, that were destroyed in Belgium and France and not replaced for budgetary reasons. Uh, yes, I'm not informed of all the details, but I do know when, the, and I'm not too sure if I'm going to speak to the question properly, but during the H1B1 uh, 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 sorry, no, uh, I, I'm, I'm not, sorry, I'm not, I'm not so informed about that, uh, um, I, on, on that pandemic and what's happened. I, I think I better refer, uh, refrain, I was going to, I was going to talk about the HIV uh, problem and what what was what the solutions were in that, but that is a different question. Uh, uh, so, so basically, the question is uh, that uh, you know that we we had some equipment bought after one of the last pandemics, but we were destroyed afterwards, and we were not well prepared for this one. You know, so 
how how can we learn some lessons from that? Well, again, if if we actually if we actually put ourselves in a state of preparedness, as I said, having regular simulations, we need to have all the stuff there and all the equipment there for such simulations, training people to use it, yes. And if we have this, uh, these masks and these uh, uh, equipment, uh, then we could use them if we have an excess of them. Maybe after this pandemic, we'll have an excess of too many masks and too much, too much equipment, but we can use such things in our training. Uh, we really should be training our young people at schools and even in, kin in, in uh, junior schools and our adults to go through a period, as I said, simulations where they can learn to wear their masks and apply it and do it properly. We can use such equipment. We didn't, but we could have used that for training purposes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from the colleagues. Sorry for this provocative question, but let's be out of the box for a minute. Do you mean that by applying these precautionary measures that you mentioned at the beginning uh, of the pandemic, we could have avoided all these contaminations and even deaths without the obligation of lockdown, a whole country and its economy? Would there have been any other way to manage it? Uh, yes, but it's not so simple to simply say that the governments could have just made some new rules. Yes, to some extent, if we had been prepared, and we had set all the committees up and all the uh, um, uh, systems up and all the supplies and made the laws and, and, and uh, some of those lessons from the East where we uh, had a, a stronger uh, uh, lockdown, but a short one. Uh, part of the problem is that, but part of the problem is our Western culture to a certain extent. Uh, it's not simply if we transfer those rules from the East and transplant them to the West, they won't work the same way because we have a different culture here. We are not going to accept uh, such strict trainings. We are not going to accept when our neighbor tells us we aren't wearing a mask because this is a proper simulation. We will laugh at the neighbor because we, are, we have a different culture in the sense. We, we don't respect such uh, obligations and we don't take them as seriously. So we, yes, we should try to apply all those lessons we learned from the East, but I'm afraid that they won't quite work the same way when we transplant them here. I mean, I can give you a, an example in history. There was a Roman uh, general called Quinctilius who wanted to collect taxes in Syria. Yeah, and there were many rich people who didn't pay taxes. Well, what did he do? He lined up some of the worst offenders and had them hanged. Terrible, yeah? Everybody paid their taxes after that. And the Syrian population said, what a strong, respectful character this Quintilius is. He knows how to get things done. They had high respect for him because that was a different culture. Then he was uh, transferred to Germania, this area with all the Goths, et cetera, and told, tried to collect taxes there. So he tried the same thing. He lined up those worst offenders and tried to kill them. Well, they, instead of respecting him, they tore him apart and killed him instead. So he couldn't apply a lesson that he learned in Syria into Germania. So there was a problem. We cannot always transfer such things. There's more to it than that where in one country they will respect such horrible autocracy and where our Western democracies will not work very well, uh, which is uh, we seem to think that we can transplant our Western ideas to these other countries and vice versa, it doesn't work. Uh, um, actually, actually, in one of the previous talks we had, uh, somebody was telling us that one of the countries that had heard the best, and you also mentioned it in your presentation, was Taiwan, which perhaps you can uh, assimilate more to our way of, of, of living than, than China, for example, you know, and there, yes. there was a very aggressive uh, tracking uh, of, uh, of contacts uh, and, and contagions, and, and there was also very strict rules to, to, you know, to enter the country, and technology was used, using data a lot, uh, also of people, so so there are ways, and you mentioned that there are ways to combine the data protection and also uh, the, uh, you know, yes. uh, the freedoms, uh, so, you know, and, 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 the, and the security. So 
perhaps a, a model like, why do you think a model like Taiwan did, uh, did uh, prosper or did succeed? And could we adapt it to our needs also in the West, let's say, with similar systems? Yes, yes, indeed. I think we can succeed. I, I will say, on one hand, we're going to have a lot of objections from the public uh, having a proper system, because this will be a, considered an invasion of privacy. But actually, I think we can, and I'm sure we can create systems that will be able to anonymously uh, uh, track and trace and identify where the problems are, and even to send messages to those whom we think could be uh, in danger, warning them without even knowing who their names are. There are ways of doing that. And as a matter of fact, my team has developed some logical methods of doing that. Uh, and as I said, we had a problem trying to sell it because uh, uh, we were told that there was not, not going to be a market. But this is possible, but it's not easy. It's difficult. It has to be researched, but it has to be demanded. And if it is demanded, then there will be solutions. And I would be very happy to uh, spend some more time uh, uh, with the right parties in case you uh, want to add some ideas about uh, potential solutions. Yes, I think it can be done, but uh, we have to overcome the uh, problem of uh, uh, the fear because we have to be able to say that this could be turned off or should be turned off after a certain period of time to tell people that uh, the governments cannot continue to operate such a system indefinitely, that automatically, unless they are really uh, given the permission to continue, that they will automatically uh, be turned off. Just like uh, when, when there is a crisis in a co country, even in a Western country, and then there's martial law. We had it in Canada. There was a six month period of martial law there when uh, uh, President de Gaulle made his uh, terrible speech, Vive le Québec libre, uh, interfering with interfering internal affairs. And right after that speech, all kinds of terrorism broke out in the province and people were killed, bombs are exploded. This is the kind of thing we can do. And we do it very effectively when we create, try to do these regime changes. And he succeeded in Quebec. And the problems in Quebec have still not gone away since he left. Uh, but uh, they had to declare martial law. But automatically after six months, martial law was lifted because the law protected us. So it was not a problem. Our freedom was given back to us. But for that period, if we were seen two people talking together on a street corner, we were told to move on. And three people, we were told that was a crowd. And we were not allowed to meet, period, basta. The soldiers were there with their rifles and they told us, move on, no problem. It did work. Uh, Sometimes we have to apply certain rules, but we have to promise that these rules will not last forever. You have safeguards that you can, and you said that you have developed that. I mean, what is surprising is that there wouldn't be a market when we can see, when we have the evidence of a country like Taiwan, when you look at the numbers, you know, that you want to cringe because of course, when you see the amount of deaths in Taiwan compared to Germany or France, as you were saying, uh, I think it's quite evident that if we can find a solution like that, where we can protect our freedom and at the same time, our security and health, we have a system that works why not use it? So why would there not be a market for that? Well, a lot of work has to be done to get it working. That's the problem. And such investment is a major investment. And one has to make sure that one has a widespread market to apply it. Otherwise, you cannot create an application that will be used by a dozen people. It has to be something uh, coming top down, not simply bottom, bottom up having a new wonderful app for your smartphone. It has to be something top down that's dictated to. I'm willing to, uh, to talk with the correct parties at the commission on this in case there is interest. Yes, it is something exciting and we can, there are solutions, but they'll be very difficult, both technically and psychologically to introduce them. Uh, for me, it's very important about the topic if we're hearing about this proposition that you're having about having the system, which for me sounds great, uh, to be able to, to, to you know, to, to comply with the data uh, protection at the same time we, we say. Yes. And then as, yesterday we had another very interesting scientist who was talking about that he has developed in the US, but he's a, he's a Spanish researcher. He has developed a, a test for COVID, which is less than five, uh, year, five uh, dollars and can be, uh, you know, very easily applied. But he was also saying there was lack of 
of market, you know. So I'm wondering uh, where are the investors for such great ideas? Uh, because uh, so if anybody's listening, I hope that they can actually propose and channel James to the right people to talk because I think they're great ideas. As we're getting really close to the end of our talk, I mean, just for one last uh, question that I find here, could you give us a comprehensive definition of cancel culture, please? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm not too sure if I can give a co comprehensive one, but I can explain to us to a certain extent. Cancel culture is this culture where if you say something that is perceived to hurt the offend feelings of any member of your audience, therefore you are not allowed to say it. And if you dare even to get up and maintain and, uh, and propose an ideology which has been uh, banned by the community that says such things are wrong, then you shouldn't even be invited to speak. That is why some speakers at Oxford Union or elsewhere in universities were not even allowed to make their uh, speeches because they were uh, uh, their subject could be interpreted as opposing what the woke community declares. And we don't even know what that declaration is because that red line of what is allowed and not allowed is moving and drifting from moment to moment. So uh, this uh, cancel culture means that we are beginning to lose our freedom of speech and our scientific uh, 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 community is being destroyed because then we are not allowed to express what we think is our scientific conclusions from data. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you so much, James. And unfortunately, we have to put an end to this very fascinating uh, talk that we have had. Uh, I hope that people have enjoyed it. I just give you another one of the comments of one of our colleagues is saying, uh, I would like to thank you very much for letting us uh, open our eyes on the importance of questioning the accepted narrative. Um, and uh, they are asking whether you could share your slides, but I guess you can. You will I will, I will, yes. Right. Super, so thank you so much, uh, James. And as you said, there were several things left that you were always saying this would be the subject of another conference. So very happy to, uh, to, to host you if whenever you would like to discuss some of the issues that you couldn't extend yourself on today. I would be very pleased to do so. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm very uh, pleased uh, that the audience has been positive uh, and not too annoyed at me. And uh, I will be also pleased I can discuss with you maybe of giving uh, uh, individual on some individual subjects. I'm not exp an expert on all of them, but I would be uh, happy to expand on some of them in separate lectures. Yes. Super. Thank I just you. see a message from the chat saying, yes, yes, please, another conference. So I, we will try to find that. Thank you so much, James. And I will ask now Karen to please put an end to our session. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, James, again, for a great presentation. And as I mentioned at the beginning, you will receive the recording in a couple of days, along with the PDF presentation from, from James. So have a lovely afternoon, everyone. I've put a link in the chat to our webpage where you'll find the details of our upcoming talks for the rest of the month. And we'll very soon publish our June program as well. So once again, thank you so much. And I'll stop the recording now. Okay, thank you very much.